Our Lord, now God, how we bless and praise your name tonight. Thank you for bringing us to this place. Thank you for those that are viewing as I speak and those that will view later. Lord, let your word touch our heart, touch our mind, condition our hearts and minds to be receptive of what you have to say to us. Speak now, thou servants are listening. Shift us from being just hearers of your word, but doers. We love you and we thank you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, while you're yet resting on your feet, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 13. Let's do these verses responsibly. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which spake unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastisement of the Lord, nor the faint when thou art rebuked of him. And if ye endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chases not? Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of Spirit and live? Now no chastening for the present seem to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, Afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Together. Amen. Thank you so much for the few moments that are ours. I solicit your prayers, and I'm not going to hold you long. Thank you so much for your presence on tonight. I want to tack this text with the subject, the necessity of discipline. The necessity of discipline. Discipline must be administered in all phases and walks of life you're going to accomplish anything, it will require a level of discipline. Students must be disciplined to study. Athletes must be disciplined to train. Christians must be disciplined to at least deny themselves. There is the discipline that is self-imposed, the discipline that is from external resources, or sources, uh, the discipline that is divine or sovereign discipline. The, the self-imposed discipline speaks of people who are self-motivated. Uh, they are people who don't need a lot of motivation because they have an internal sense of discipline themselves. And, doing what is necessary to take them to the next level. However, there are many who are not blessed with the gift of self-imposed discipline. Some need some additives, some extra, some external resources, like a mama or a daddy or uh, a motivator in our lives to carry us to that next level. And then there is the divine discipline where God 
steps in our lives and interrupts our lives to change, correct, control our behavior. Ouch, preacher, I didn't want to hear that. But let me, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there are some crooked ways in all of us that need to be made straight. Yes, I'm talking to you tonight. Please don't tune me out. There is some crooked ways in you uh, that need to be made straight. And God must discipline us to bring out the best in us, to change our wicked ways to correct those deviant ways and to control those ways in which we allow the flesh to run rampant on our lives. This vehicle of discipline, hear me ladies and gentlemen, it is needed. We need discipline. We don't like discipline because we don't like nobody telling us what to do. I'm grown and can't nobody, even God, tell me what to do. Consequently, we reject discipline, but you never get too old to receive instructions and even correction. It ought to be a unanimous a man in the house. This captain was on a, a warship and he saw what appeared to be in a distance a light. And he signaled to the ships around, listen, I am captain so and so. I am driving this warship and you need to change your course 10 degrees. There was no response. He got back on the radio and said, I am captain so and so. I'm on this warship. We are headed in that direction. You need to change your course. 10 degrees. No response. The captain got back on the radio forceful and said, listen, if you don't change your course, I'm going to blow your ship up. And then he got a response from what he thought was a ship. And this man said, I am a first class seaman, so and so. He said, Captain, I, I hate to inform you, this is not a boat or a ship. This is a lighthouse. Therefore, you need to change your course 10 degrees. And it becomes a humbling experience. But, but some of us will do well in life if we humble ourselves to take some instructions. I, I, I know it's hard sometimes, but we will humble ourselves and do better if we only take some instruction. Well, a week ago, we talked about Hebrews chapter 12, this discipline of running, but tonight we want to talk about this discipline of enduring chastisement. We want to talk about this discipline of enduring, the necessity of discipline. Well, Let me tell you how it works, y'all. Sometime how it works. The Lord will allow your sin to be exposed by a spiritual person. Galatians 6 and 1 says, brother, if, if a brother be overtaken in the fault, Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thy also be tempted. This verse, first of all, tells us that everybody can't restore you. 
because everybody is not spiritual. I, I, I know in settings like this, we want to say we're spiritual, but everybody is not spiritual. God will allow your stuff to get out by, and, and, and will be exposed by a spiritual person. And that person don't come to you to rebuke you for the most part. But that person comes to you to restore you. To, to restore you. And he gives you this sense of discipline. And I need to tell you too, ladies and gentlemen, don't rebuke voices in your life that speaks truth. You see... Truth without love will leave people broken. Love without truth will leave people blind. I think I need to say that again. Truth without love will leave people broken. But love without truth will leave people blind. And you need somebody in your life to tell you your skirt is hanging. You need somebody in your life to tell you your tie is crooked. And don't rebuke the truth that you hear. I know it hurts but it will help you down the road. I know it don't feel good while it's happening, but it will be a blessing down the road. A couple of things I will share about this text and get out of your way. I think the music ministry, they brought a lot of energy into the room, but it looked like the energy done, done left. Y'all here, I can't, I, can't see you, I can't see you smile, so I don't know, I don't know. But, but I'm going to press on, I'm going to press on. Y'all come on in and come on in where you are. Oh, there you go, there you go. All right, all right, all right. First point I want to share here is the process of discipline. Please look at verse 5, and if you hadn't closed your Bible. The process of of discipline. Look at verse 5. It says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, my daughter, despise not thou chastising of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. He says, don't despise it. Matter of fact, Embrace it. Celebrate it. Embrace it to the point where you take it in. Now this word, chastise, it does mean discipline and correction, but it has another meaning. It also means to train and to instruct. To train or to instruct. I used to love it when I would mess up, and my dad, he didn't punish me, but he used it as a learning experience. And boy, I'd be standing there taking deep breaths, saying to the Lord, Lord, I thank you that all I'm going to get this time is a lecture. And sometimes his chastisement is just a lecture. And you ought to give God a strong praise because you didn't get what you should have got. God gave you time out when he should have given you his wrath. God lets your golden moments roll on even when he should have cut you short. And every one of us owe him a strong praise on the mere fact that this word... Chasing does not necessarily mean to discipline or punish, but sometimes he used our lives experience as a teaching moment to teach us 
and to train us and to show us. So it ain't always a beat down. Aren't you glad we serve a loving God? But, 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 but not only should we, not, not only should we em, embrace it or, or, or not cast it away, but we should know that he cares. Look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chastens, and scorch every son whom he receives. This word, scorch, it means to whoop. It means pain. I used to hear growing up, this going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And it took me having my own for me to realize there's some truth to that. God does not want to beat us, to hurt us, to harm us. He's not trying to drown us. He's just teaching us how to swim. He cares for us. Psalms 103, verse 13 says, Like a father pities his child, so the Lord pities us. Another word for pities, he has compassion. As a father has compassion for their children, or mother have compassion for their children. God has compassion for us. And somebody can give him praise on the mere fact it is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because his compassion faileth not. He loves us and he cares for us so much that he disciplines us. And he will not allow us to stay in the shape that we are in. Not only should we not cast it away, but know that he cares, but then also know that he is concerned. Look at verse 7. Verse 7 says, if ye endure chastening, God deals with you as a son. For what son is he whom the father chases not? If you are his child, he's going to chasten you. He's going to discipline you. That's, that's why the child of God can't do what they want to do. As bad as I don't want to forgive. Am I the only one in here wrestling with forgiveness? As bad as I don't want to forgive, I got to forgive. Because the Lord chastens, discipline, scourge. He will whoop you into his will. And even when I say I ain't going to love, I ain't going to give, and I ain't going to do, there's something called conviction. Anybody ever been under conviction? When you are under conviction, he won't let you stay in that old stanky way. He will allow you to do what you said you wouldn't do. And you will end up giving in, and then you'll say, Lord, I don't want to appear weak to people because people are going to take my kindness yeah, for weakness. Yeah. But I've learned, let the Lord handle that. God know how to deal with those who despisely use you and mistreat you. God will deal with them. But your heart got to be right because you got to give forgive, not so much for them, but for you, you the one can't sleep at night. And folks, you mad at sleeping all night long. You the one missing meals and they eating up everything they can eat. And you holding grudges. He puts it down. The process of discipline 
He cares, he concerns, but then there is the purpose of discipline. Please look at nine through eight. The purpose of discipline is number one, to correct. Please look at verse eight. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not the son. Every child ought to resemble and look like their father or have some resemblance of your dad. He says, if I don't chastise you, you're not mine. I do it because I'm not going to let you stay in that old crooked way. Because you then will become a stumbling block for sinners. Listen how Psalms 1 said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the unrighteous, nor stand in the way of sinner, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. Most of the time, maybe I'll say most of the time, a lot of the time, that those that are part of the fellowship makes it hard for others to come in because of your attitude and your character in which you refuse to shape or change in any kind of way. Shame on you. You've been under this word 14, 15 years. And you still the same old way. Gray hair does not constitute wisdom. Old age does not constitute a wise person. And if the Holy Spirit is not living in you, if God is not shaping and molding and, and guiding you and sometimes even putting you in places you don't want to be, the Lord says, those folks, they ain't mine. And I need to tell you, everybody to show up at this place ain't on the Lord's side. Everybody that show up at this place, God does not call them his own. But not only correction, the purpose of discipline, but then there is this purpose of being Christ-like. Please look at verse 10. For they barely for a few days chasing us after their own pleasure. For he, but for, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. He does it because we should be Christ-like. There ought to be something about us that look like Christ, that resemble Christ, that act like Christ. That's why we're going to do a study on the life of Christ so we'll know how to behave like Christ. We, we're going to do a study on the teachings of Christ. That may be the reason the body of Christ is suffering with being Christ-like is because we don't know what Christ was like. I wish I had some help here. And when we understand what Christ is like, then we can be more Christ-like. The reason he does it, because he wants not to hurt us or harm us, but everything that does not look like Christ, he works on us to transform us, to shift us from being where we are. But not only do we see the purpose of discipline to correct, to be Christ-like, but then thirdly, compensation, to have compensation. Look at verse 11. Now no chastisement for the present seem to be joyous. When we're going through, it's not a happy experience. When you exercising, you training, you discipline yourself, you studying, 
it does not feel good. It's not joyous. It's not, it's grievous. Nevertheless, after, afterward, it yields some fruit here. Peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Those who are disciplined, those who are chastised, there are some benefits. There are some compensation. And the compensation is fruits of peace and righteousness. I know that, that may not sound like much, but you do know peace is something money can't buy. And righteousness is something we cannot buy. Because that is all given through the power of God through Jesus Christ. And you and I have the righteousness of God, and we have the peace of God, and the peace with God. But it comes through the discipline that God places on our life, which we many times reject, cast aside, and do not want. But God uses thee to bring some fruit in our life. And who among us don't need a little peace? Who among us don't need any righteousness? Preacher gives this story of the potter and the clay. He gives this story of how the clay start talking to the potter. And as the potter gets the clay, he smashes the clay. He put pressure on the clay, and the, the clay started screaming out, said, man, what are you doing? And the potter just keeps on working. He stretches the clay, and the clay said, man, you're stretching me too far. What are you doing? Yeah, come on. And the potter keep just keep on working. Yeah, yeah. Keeps on molding, yeah. shaping, and making the clay. Yeah. And the clay keeps crying out, man, what are you doing? Kind of sound like us, don't it? Yeah. When, when God is moving in our life, we wonder, Lord, what are you doing? Then the potter puts the clay in the fire and turn the heat up. And although the, the potter could not hear him, the clay yelling out, and he could see his mouth moving, if you will, saying, man, what are you doing? Are you trying to burn me up? But when he brings it out of the fire, that clay looks at itself. Say, I don't look like clay no more. Put a little paint on him and dress him up. And what was considered dirt and nothing is a valuable piece. And can I tell somebody in this place, I know the world looks at you as dirt and the world looks at you as nobody, but stay in the hand of the pot. As long as you're in the hand of the potter, I know sometimes it's going to hurt. I know sometimes there's pain with it, but it's pain with purpose. God has purpose to this pain. He's only trying to mold us, shape us to what he would have us to be. I come tell somebody tonight that pain you're feeling is just the potter. Molding and shaping. He wants you to look like him. And it's a process, y'all. Sometimes and most times, it's a painful process. But oh, stay in the hand of the potter. Now, the Hebrew writer goes back to this illustration of running. Verse 12 and 13. And we done, y'all. He goes back to this illustration of running. Watch what he says here. Wherefore, lift up your hands, which hangs down. Got any joggers in here, runners? The first thing that happens when you are tired and fatigued and running is you drop your hands. 
I don't know how many runners we got in here, but <laughs> you'll drop your hands. The next thing that will happen, your knees get feeble. Legs start getting, getting weak. I don't know how many runners we got, but if you're running, this is what's going to happen. Then your feet start getting tired and sore. But he says, through the discipline and divine wisdom, that your hands won't drop. Your feet won't hurt. And your knees won't get weak. Because you have submitted yourself to the discipline of God. And anybody tell you running, there is some discipline with running. You got to learn how to control your breathing. I wish I had some athletes in here. When you're running, you got to learn how to control your breathing and, and keep moving your arms because this is part of the process of going forward. And he says, if you use this discipline, it'll keep your hands up. It'll keep your legs and feet strong so you will be able to run the race and not faint. You see, the reason you are getting tired on the race is because you don't, you don't have discipline. You're lacking discipline in your run. But if he says, if you let me discipline you, you'll be able to run just a little while longer. You'll be able to run just a little further. Let me just finish reading this, and then we're done, y'all. Look what he says, verse 12. Wherefore, lift up the hand which hangs down, and the feeble knees, and make straight the path for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. But let it rather be healed. The Lord says, I can make your path straight if you follow my discipline. You'll be able to go further, run longer, stay in the race if you let me have my way in discipline you. What I've come to know and what I've learned in the body of Christ, there are many who have yet to surrender to God. Is his will against our will. And you will not see the best of God until you submit and surrender and let God have its way. He disciplined us not to hurt and hinder, but he wants to bring help, hope, and healing. Didn't you see healing in our text? He wants to bring help, hope, and healing. I don't know how y'all feel about it, but I thank God he didn't leave me alone. I thank God he kept at me, kept convicting me, and kept his hand on me. He wants to correct, change, challenge so he can convert us and convince us that he is the way. And so I say to the Lord, have your way in my life. Mold me, make me, and shape me. Even if, here's a big one, y'all. We say that in church all the time, but I don't think we really mean it. Even if you got to break me, mold me, make me, and shape me into what you will have me to be. I don't know how y'all feel about it, but I'm glad I'm in his hands. 
And I said Sunday that even when he whooped me, he still got his hand on me. I, I need him to hold me in his hand because I can go astray. I stand in need of correction. I can be a disgrace to my family and to this church on the way home. But if the Lord don't keep me, I wish I had some help here. I thank God for the Holy Spirit leading and guiding me. Won't he lead you? And won't he guide you? I thank God for the necessity of his discipline. I wouldn't be where I am had it not been for the necessity of his discipline. We rebuke discipline, but we need to embrace it. It's just God's way of telling us, I love you. I care for you. I love you too much to let you just go astray. Question was asked, will people come back to church, pastors, and I've been talking and I've, I've said, the people of God are going to come back. Because God will not allow us to go astray. You can say what you will, man. There are those who feel I can just learn the Bible all by myself, at the house by myself. And I'll say a hundred times, you're never your best self by yourself. Iron sharpens iron. God has priests and prophets and leaders to feed into our soul. And that discipline of worship, that discipline of praise will always be a part of the child of God's life. And just something about showing up to worship. There's something about being in the house. One more time. It's Something about even if I'm at home viewing, there's something about engaging in the word of God. God's word is sharper than any two-headed sword. And what is it doing? It's correcting. It's rebuking. Thank God for the necessity of discipline. Amen and amen. Amen. If you stand to your feet, everyone standing, we want to extend the invitation. I want to invite you to come if they have anyone here that need to, to come. You can come now. The Lord will receive you. We will receive you.